it's a house, right? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of your general houses here. All right. Good evening, everyone. And uh, a very warm welcome to the first seminar for the Centre for English Legal History for Easter 2024. Firstly, a couple of quick reminders. Uh, we will be recording the seminar for upload to the Centre's YouTube channel. And as usual, we will be heading to the Granta for drinks and dinner after the seminar. And you're all most welcome to come along. This evening, we're delighted to have Jake Stattle presenting. Jake is currently a PhD candidate in medieval his candidate in medieval history within the Faculty of History here at Cambridge. He holds a BA from Swarthmore College in the US, where he majored in classical studies and an MPhil in medieval history here at the University of Cambridge. His MPhil dissertation was published as the article Legal Culture in the Dane Law, a study of is it three Ethelred? Three Ethelred, and has been awarded three best article prizes from scholarly societies including the Sutherland Prize for British Legal History. His PhD thesis investigates and evaluates Scandinavian influences upon English legal culture, leading up to the formation of the common law. This evening, he will be presenting Love or Law, Scandinavian Foundations in Medieval English Dispute Settlements. Please join me in welcoming Jake. Hey, thank you, Roz, and uh, thank you to you and Doug as well for organizing this, and thank you all for coming. Um, just to start with a little bit of a preface that this is all going to be work in progress um, from my ongoing PhD, um, and particularly what I wanted to take the advantage of today of, of having the group of you um, is synthesizing some of the ideas that I've been working on for the past two years uh, to sort of bring them together. Um, so there's going to be quite a lot of disparate strands that I'm hoping to make some sense of, and then I'm interested in getting your thoughts and questions at the end. So do bear with me. Um, so I think to begin with, uh, I'd like to place us sort of in this historical context uh, which underlies my work and sort of initiated uh, this entire project for me. And that might seem a bit strange because it's the Vikings. Um, but uh, particularly for the last 10 years or so, um, this has been a really exciting moment in scholarship uh, surrounding the Scandinavians in England. Um, particularly, this is changing our entire understanding kind of of the Viking presence in England um, and their settlement of much of the North and East. Um, there's been groundbreaking new studies, particularly in archaeology, um, and these vast arrays of metalwork finds um, that have really changed the way that we understand uh, this society. There's also other technological uh, abilities that have been coming to the fore, such as DNA and isotope analysis that have been playing a role, as well as reevaluating uh, more traditional um, historical sources, such as Old Norse place names. So the point being that we're in a moment of scholarly reevaluation. And the big takeaway is that we've been increasingly convincing evidence that the Viking Age saw significant migrations of Scandinavians into England when we're talking about tens of thousands of people versus some scholars in the past thought it was more about hundreds. Um, and we're not just talking about these armies that came in the late ninth century, but it looks to be multiple waves of settlers after that, including women and children. This also goes along with major land disruption and resettlement. And we can much more properly think about Anglo-Scandinavian society developing here as something distinctive from the rest of England in important ways, uh, economically, culturally, linguistically. Uh, so my my work comes from part of this reevaluation prompts us to reflect more deeply upon the law that developed in these societies and understand them in their own right, which is particularly appropriate since the Dane law is the term that has usually been given to this area and the law that goes along with it. So uh, these regions of northern, eastern, modern England uh, were conquered and incorporated into the growing kingdom of the English um, during the 10th century, uh, headed by the West Saxon dynasty, and this was mostly completed by the mid 10th century. Now, in their law codes from around the same time, we also see royal recognition of legal differences in the Dane law, such as Edgar's code, even here, um, that seems to respect some of these laws and leave local matters and jurisdiction up to them. Then we see the term Dana Lago properly um, appear uh, after the turn of the millennium to refer to the place and the law that goes along with it, uh, recognizing that there are differences here. Um, and but we're generally getting little insight into what these are um, in most of these English codes. 
uh, we get some sort of reference that this sort of thing will be handled this way in Wessex and will be handled differently in the Dane law, but we're not given many details. Uh, this continues even after 1066, um, where in a way the distinctions are described at least in some of these Anglo-Norman legal treatises um, as being even more stark, uh, but also probably reflect less reality, such as this section from the Legis Enrique Primi, uh, which talks about the tripartite legal division of England, which might not reflect very much reality. But where my work has focused on is trying to see some of the actual differences in legal practice on the ground in the Dane law. And for this, I've looked primarily at this royal code of Ethelred, which seems directed specifically at the Dane law and mentions the five boroughs, but also contains quite a lot of Old Norse terms, many of which are appearing for the first time in English here. And there's also very many different legal ideas than we see in the rest of 10th century England. So I argue that here we're seeing a preservation of Anglo-Scandinavian legal practices and some of their earliest codification. Traditional historiography has not been very interested in exploring much of this, um, often taking it as a novelty uh, or paying little attention. But uh, if you ever have heard of this code, it's probably because a few of its quirks uh, seem quite interesting, including what looks quite a lot like the later common law juries of presentment in which there's this discussion of 12 things that accuse notorious criminals. Um, but I think beyond this, we should be looking at this code in its own right as Anglo-Scandinavian law, um, not as part of the greater monolith of Anglo-Saxon law. And in comparing um, some of these practices to Scandinavia, which we're now able to do more so than ever because of increased scholarship and focus on this, particularly in English, um, we're able to seriously consider uh, how some of these legal features might have developed in this way in a Scandinavian context, as well as considering this particular context in England of a military occupation followed by colonization. Now, why does this matter? Well, it's different that having a different Dane law legal culture begs the question of what happened to these legal ideas, particularly since a very large area of England made up the Dane law, and even later records like the Doomsday Book suggest that this was the most populated and wealthy parts of England, making up some of the largest urban centers. But beyond this, there are also specific themes and areas where the Dane law and Scandinavian legal concepts seem quite similar to the way that English law develops later over the following few centuries that I've been studying. The jury of Thanes is one kind of more famous example of that, but I think that's just one taste of what could be sort of larger but more subtle shifts uh, happening in English legal culture more generally. And so that's sort of the entire basis of my project. But today, what I'd like to speak to you about is um, how some of these concepts could be influencing dispute behavior in England and how by combining some of these mechanics um, that we can chart in the Dane law, we might be seeing something of a handling of disputes in later England uh, shifting along these lines. Um, so to do this, I'm going to narrow in a bit to talk about dispute revolving around personal violence um, and how to resolve it. So. Just a note on historiography that early medieval dispute has been a really important area of development in 20th century scholarly thought, uh, particularly this anthropological turn. And our understanding is greatly improved of seeing how early medieval societies um, process disputes and often through few violence, informal negotiation um, alongside formal uh, legal protocols um, and court decisions. And all of these are interacting in diverse ways with um, historians like Susan Reynolds being very important to this. But to narrow in on Anglo-Saxon England, um, sort of as the baseline from which I would like to compare uh, what we see elsewhere to, um, we can see that dispute here resolves largely around compensation. And when you first learn about Anglo-Saxon law, um, probably the first thing you'll learn is where guilds, that people have a value to them, uh, which is associated if they are harmed. Um, but Anglo-Saxon England is quite particular in having this regimented compensation in a sort of value hierarchy in a quite set way. Not only does everyone have a wear guild, but there's set values for all sorts of harms done down to the exact details of their fingers being harmed or anything else like that. So we can see this may be the best example in Alfred's law code that I showed here. But royal legislation is also not opposed to private violence, the feud. Um, these systems work together to maintain order, and this is something that my supervisor, Tom Lambert, has worked on extensively, and he usually terms this a complementary vertical and horizontal axes of, of control to maintain order. 
But I think it's important to point out that compensation is not happening alongside the law. Compensation is the law of Anglo-Saxon England. And disputes over, say, violence have a quite firm framework to work from as they're set up in our royal legislation. And this can all be done in quite accessible public local courts. So royal law is setting the foundations and rules of engagement for the system. They set the amounts, they create structures, including making rules, providing protection and enforcing cooling off periods. Um, so there's a quite high degree of involvement in dispute when compared to other places. But beyond this, we can see even specific royal efforts to regulate disputes, um, often to curtail excessive feud violence. And the example usually pointed to, which, which I include here, is the Code Second Edmund, um, which I think we can also see is, is not abolishing feud, but it's creating quite um, strict regulations around it, showing at least the effort to create active royal influence over the process of violent dispute and assisting in it, but also giving tools in order to end a dispute. So uh, this is sort of what I would like to compare to the Dane law in later England as, as the baseline that we're going from. And in order to do this, I'd like to continue to talk about historiography just a little bit um, to go to Stephen D. White and Michael Clanchy, who helped to create an influential new paradigm for envisioning dispute in medieval Europe, specifically in these papers from 1978 and 83, where they both discuss the idea of love and law. And they use this as a binary to talk about formal law, which is done in courts, a judgment is rendered, you have maybe an overseeing authority, there's possibly in line with written legislation, versus informal, being amicable settlement that's reached through negotiation or arbitration, in which, as Clancy discusses, likely made up the great majority of legal activity in the medieval period, but is, and is probably often preferred, but is not often recorded in surviving evidence. So for this paradigm, both historians open their pieces by quoting the Legis Enrique Primi, and particularly this section on love overcoming a judgment. Um, so the origins of this love or law concept and the seemingly unique terminological construction is unclear. And uh, I think another appearance in this same text uh, gives us some important clues. So this is, again, saying basically the same thing of, of love overcoming law. It's being echoed in slightly different phrasing um, here from a discussion of partners disputing over property owned in common in which love is mentioned as an agreement um, in order to resolve a dispute. But then after that comes this section um, about choosing between um, love or law. And if love is chosen, it should stand just as much as love as law. Now, Clanchy notes that the Leges Henrique here is recalling Anglo-Saxon law, but I would go further and say that it's actually a nearly exact translation from a pre-conquest clause, and that this might actually reflect Dane law, law because this clause is from the Wantage Code. So I tried to show this uh, with the coloring and spacing here a little bit to see just how close um, of a translation that this is. Um, also, uh, at the bottom, I included the clause from the Wantage Code being rendered into the Latin translation of the Quadripartitus. Um, so that is the Anglo-Norman compilation created by the same author as the Legis Henrici. And from the Latin here, we can see just how quite cleanly um, this is being copied over, and it's it's mostly exactly on. So uh, the Legis Henrici author is undoubtedly um, has this section in mind, at least when he's writing this specific clause. Uh, but I would argue that the particular Dane law influence of it may be grander and more generally shaped the legal depiction of love in this text and elsewhere, given that this clause in wantage is the only one of its kind in any pre-conquest legal text. So uh, what actually is uh, love and law and why do, are we seeing this phrase? So the context of the clause in wantage is within this sort of strange latter half of the text of seemingly random groupings of various measures of all sorts of different topics. Um, but this one comes, comes after a section of thanes um, who are described as voting and then making judgments called doom. So we can assume that this is probably connected because it mentions a thane and doom again. Um, but it also seems to be more of a general statement that love should stand as strong as, as law and judgment, um, maybe to be applied more broadly. Now, to look at the words themselves, lagu here is where a modern word law comes from, 
and is an Old Norse loan uh, that appears in the Dane law at this time and is first associated with Scandinavian laws, uh, first appearing in that same code from Edgar in the 960s. So there's a clear and relatively recent Scandinavian heritage to the word lagu being used here. Love, lufu, is a native Old English term that is much more rare in legislation, um, and we see it occasionally in uh, terms of Christian love for God, uh, as mentioned in the laws, um, in a general emotional sense. And there is one time in a 10th century fragment um, where there's a mention of what could be translated as obtaining love um, when ending a feud, which possibly suggests this, this meaning having to do with settlement. Now, given the clear Dane law implications of Lagu and the strangeness of Lufu, as it appears in Wantage, with no clear precedence anywhere else, the phrase love or law certainly begs a question of outside influence from Viking Age Scandinavians, something suggested by Lady Stenton in her 1963 Jane lectures. So I'd like to pursue this a little bit, and in order to do so, I think we should look at the related Scandinavian term, Old Norse lof. Now, this word and its cognates appear throughout our earliest legislation from all of the Nordic countries and comes to mean consent, permission, license. And even the modern Nordic languages retain this with love in Swedish and Norwegian. But what is particularly interesting is the appearance of lof along with the word for law in Scandinavian legislation in the same phrasing as it is in the Wantage Code. So there are three instances in the same court procedure section of the Graugas, the earliest laws of Iceland, and here they mention in reference to men gathering in court to decide on law and licenses, with these licenses being dispensations that include pardons, forgiveness of penalties, and importantly, often refer to permission to enter a private settlement, which would otherwise be forbidden. Now, sometimes permission for settlement seems to be the primary meaning of law as it's used. We also see this, this same dynamic appear in the Norwegian Gulathing law and uh, in a narrative text in the same manner. We see it appearing just, just at, like this twice in the longest and most famous of the Icelandic sagas, Njal saga, um, where it's used to describe the regulations for creating the newly established court, again with Lof seeming to refer to permission to settle. Now, the appearance of the phrase in the Swedish laws from even later implies that Lof as negotiation is being focused on, with many of these appearances in the law and land um, where we see it for offenses such as plowing into the field of your neighbor or collecting their timber. If you do so, you have to answer if you've done it by lof eller lage. Now, one instance even mentions he descends and he defends himself with lof or lego, really um, seeming to refer to ways to end dispute in these two manners, uh, recollecting uh, what we saw in the Wantage Code. Now, some work has been done on alliterative pairs in Old Norse, of which there are many a handful of which have made their way into English and appear in Middle English texts, and some even survive today, such as friends and fellows. But uh, this was a particularly characteristic of legal phraseology, including bruised and bloody as a designation for a certain level of harm in law codes. So lof or log likely seems to fit within this pattern. And it's also a catchy phrase that sums up a larger, more complicated idea. Now, it has been suggested that this alliterative phrase found its way to the Dane law, and Old Norse lof might have been assimilated into the more familiar and broad Old English lufu, with this technical legal sense being mixed into the various meanings as it was incorporated over these centuries, all in a large linguistic flux that we know was happening over the decades of Old Norse's influence on Old English. Now, Old English lufu may have had its legal meaning transformed to include the Scandinavian sense, which is associated with permission and with settlement, and now fits along in an alliterative binary phrase that sums up this wider idea and sounds catchy. This wider idea, the concept behind love and law and the legal dynamics they create might be something that we can see in effect in Scandinavian law. And so to do this, I'd like to make some analogies and focus in on Iceland, for which we have some of the most early examples and records, and also I think is a society worth comparing as a place that was also settled by similar Scandinavian peoples around the same time. So in Iceland, there's not much of a compensation system for crimes like this um, at all in the legislation that we have, the Graugas. 
uh, there certainly is not this sort of wear guild structure that you have in England. Instead, there are only punitive measures. Specifically, the go-to seems to be either greater or lesser outlawry, for which you can be killed by anyone with no consequences and your life being forfeited. Greater outlawry is for the most serious crimes, and the term is literally forest dweller. And this was a prominent part of Icelandic culture, of men being forced um, to try to survive in the hostile countryside after being um, exiled by their society. And this appears often in the sagas. Um, lesser outlawry of three-year exile is even more common, at least in the legislation. And we see it being levied for all sorts of very minor and quite procedural crimes, such as missteps around attending an assembly, accidentally leaving early or not arriving on time. <laughs> and we also see this lesser outlawry through your exile happening to, to a few famous characters, such as Eric the Red, which is why he then went on to discover uh, Greenland. Um, so we're given an impression of de jure strict punitive measures um, that are being levied for seemingly all crimes in Iceland, uh, with this being really the only successful outcome for an accuser who might want to take their case uh, for adjudication to an assembly. Um, now, this assembly would often come down to the formal courts of Iceland, being the largest of which is the all thing um, of all of Iceland. And of course, practically, this being a very large country um, with a very small population, this the all thing would only occur once a year um, and would be for the most uh, important crimes. Now, quarter courts occur three times a year, but this is still not very often. Um, and also the all thing is is held on these dramatic cliffs in the middle of the country that you can still go and see. But even uh, if you take a case to the all thing, uh, there's no government body uh, to enforce any of the decisions that they make. Um, this is all still based upon private violence and kinship groups and relationships. Um, which means um, that even if you're able to win a case, um, you're really only able to carry it out if you're able to muster your own support to do so, and particularly having your own powerful kin group. And if you're going against a powerful person, this could be very difficult. So even a decision by, um, by the, the overseeing court um, has relatively uh, little to do um, against a condemned outlaw, other than possibly cutting off some of their support and rallying uh, people against them. So uh, if you want an issue resolved, especially when we're talking about potential feud, um, you would probably like it resolved more quickly um, to decrease continued violence. And so if you're doing that, you're going to need to do it outside of court. So that brings us to the fact that in the legal narratives uh, that we see in the sagas, and the sagas also just seem to be obsessed with litigation, um, which makes them quite boring to most people, uh, negotiated settlements are everywhere, uh, particularly in the Al-Saga. Um, so we might be seeing a dynamic of de jour outlawry and de facto negotiated settlement. Um, and the work of Bill Miller has been particularly influential here. So he points out that there's relatively little incentive for either party to go to a court. A defendant wouldn't want to face outlawry and a plaintiff um, loses their ability to gain compensation. And it also seems unlikely that it would really end ongoing violence. Now, uh, Bill Miller's points out that in court you win or you lose, and these relatively high stakes of outlawry for a defendant also means humiliation uh, for a plaintiff. So, um, and of course, even if, if you win, you then have to go and pursue this person on your own or with your own supporters. So instead, settlements seem to make quite a lot of sense, particularly in local societies like these, with continued opportunity to end the dispute in a flexible manner where you can adjust the amounts and conditions upon circumstances and mitigating factors, which is something you cannot do with the blanket outlawry as set out in the Graugus. Um, both sides are also able to save face, and it seems much more likely to actually bring compliance and an end to violence. Now, the nature of punitive law being on the books seems to encourage that this dynamic of serving as a stick that is encouraging settlement since in-court decisions were often quite undesirable, particularly for a defendant facing outlawry. So we're seeing informal settlement as common practice in the shadow of formal law. Possibly this is an intentional aspect of Icelandic legal culture. Um, and I've not talked about, but this is something that we also um, might be seeing at play in other legal areas from Scandinavian areas. And it's possible that this, this sort of concept could be summed up by love or law. <laughs> 
And of course, just, just to say, we, we can see many of the examples of this in the saga, so I included one here. Um, but there's another telling example in Njal's saga where he's representing his friend Gunnar, and he's quite confident that they'll be able to win the case, but he's, they still choose to make a settlement anyway, and even to the fact of accepting lesser outlawry. So there's a recognition that even if you think that you could win a case, it might not be in your best interests, especially when it comes to ending violence. So um, I think it's also interesting to think about if we might be seeing something comparable to this dynamic in the Wantage Code and then in the Dane Law. So I don't want to dwell into the details of this um, very much, and these are things that I touch upon um, in the article if you're interested, but I think that yes, in some ways, the Wantage Code diverts clearly from the rest of Anglo-Saxon legislation, and there are indications of increased harshness of formal law, particularly against criminal defendants. Um, maybe they're being pressured towards settlement, um, particularly given the inclusion of the love or law clause. Um, just, just to say, uh, for example, um, accusations themselves seem to be much more dangerous for defendants and carry a heavier weight in court. And they also carry consequences in themselves, even if they're not proven. Um, it's also more difficult for a defendant to clear themselves of wrongdoing, most notably being a reduction of the Anglo-Saxon standard compurgation oath. There even seems uh, to be that access to proof procedures was made conditional and was not assumed for all free men, making the accused by law in close parallels to other places in Scandinavia. And also, uh, we see much stricter hypothetical punishments, uh, including the threat of outlawry and the ability to outlaw someone with public declaration, something very similar to what we see in Iceland. Um, but there's also the use of the death penalty to what seems to be a higher degree, as well as possibly uh, what I argue is the first collective punishment um, seen anywhere in England, also included in the code. So all this evidence is just a little bit of an indication um, that uh, my thesis explores about how these legal practices continue and might align in interesting ways with how English law generally develops across from the 10th to the 12th centuries. So a major trend, which I keep coming back to as I explore this through different axes, is that criminal law is becoming more punitive, less forgiving, and putting more prosecutorial power at the king's disposal across these decades. In general, by the end of the period and the later 12th century, we're seeing the balance of power seeming to have shifted significantly in criminal cases, much more towards the accusing force, which have much reduced options for the defendant to defend themselves. And this is both in private and public prosecution. There are some specific strands that suggest possible Scandinavian influence coming out of the Dane law on some of these aspects, possibly being purposefully incorporated by English kings who maybe encountered this during their conquests and found it quite attractive as a way to prosecute wrongdoers and then also to um, receive uh, goods. And um, there's this also could have just been mixed in the milieu of legal ideas that were swirling um, and found themselves incorporated into common law at the end of this period. But in this context, I find this dynamic of punitive legal system pressuring parties towards settlement being summed up by love or law as something that's also worth exploring as sort of the reaction to this. Um, and let's see if we can see it in later English dispute settlement. So just to show a little bit of the afterlife of the term love uh, in English dispute system, uh, which has possibly been affected by Scandinavian influence. So we can see elsewhere in the Leges and Riki Primi um, that the word love is clearly being used to refer to negotiated settlement throughout, uh, including that saying one can unite through love or go to a county court, as well as mentioning proceeding through love uh, to end a dispute. Um, but interestingly, the word love is not used anymore in later treatises, and by Glanville, um, it's still expressing the same idea in similar phrases, um, but is using other terms, uh, most commonly peace. We also see love mentioned in some early case narratives. Uh, in Shrewsbury, we interestingly see uh, the statement that resolving through love rather than through plea um, in a case where an amount of money was agreed upon and paid uh, for ownership of the village. But there's still this binary of negotiation and formal judgment, which in a way seems reminiscent of the love or law phrasing. Similarly, uh, from Ramsey, we see a similar payment of 
silver and horses is made between the abbots. And they are then granting uh, the land through love. And then love days uh, continue to feature later on into the period. Um, and these seem to be days of arbitration when people come together. And we see this appearing in literature, um, particularly in Chaucer. But it, it's all we're thinking about. Um, there is a possibility that some of the origin behind this um, comes from a level of Scandinavian influence. Um, so beyond looking at the term love, I'm interested in how we might be seeing this love or law dynamic at work more broadly in early common law case records. Um, so uh, again, I, I think it's valuable to think about that the later 12th century were in a shifted environment of legal power, where things are much more threatening to criminals than they were before. There's more of an infrastructure for public prosecution. There's an enlarged establishment of the king's peace with many crimes categorized as breaking it that would put you under the king's mercy and, and under immersement. There's harsh maximalist punishments more so than before, including more death, maiming, outlawry, and exile. And there's a threat of obtainable writs, which makes it more possible um, for individuals to pursue claims against others. And for public prosecution, there's an increasingly real danger of jury presentment, which could force you, um, if, if you're suspected, um, to then go to the painful ordeal. And even if you succeed in the ordeal and are proved innocent, you still have to go into permanent exile, as we're told in the um, Assize of Clarendon. So I think for understanding this period, um, for me, Roger D. Groot, uh, an American lawyer, has been very influential, um, particularly in a series of three articles he wrote around 1980. Um, so in particular, I want to focus on dispute over violence. Um, so for this period, it's private criminal prosecution, and this is something he discusses in a 1983 article. Now, Groot illustrates the structure, which I show on the left here in this chart, um, that highlights some of the dynamics that are under the surface of private prosecution, including um, that by the late 12th century, there were de facto jury decisions um, being made in these cases, or at least there was an option for them to be made. Um, now, I also think it's an important aspect um, of this being a multi-step process that uh, if it proceeds to a measure of proof between the parties, that proof is trial by battle. Now, this dynamic lends itself to the type of resolution in the shadow of law, given the quite extreme stakes of trial by battle with serious punishments for losing, while the procedural steps along the way, and even the purposeful um, needing to pause, uh, creates more opportunities the time and the space in order to negotiate and come to a settlement. In fact, it seems that this was often a tactic uh, to begin an initial stage of proceedings with the expectation of settling and receiving compensation, something that Naomi Hernard calls blackmail appeals. So Brute does a survey of pre-1215 cases, and he finds this quite high number of those in which an appeal was begun, um, but then it does not proceed. And these are often for quite serious cases, like breaching the king's peace, armed robbery, assaults, which carry very serious penalties. But um, you're not technically allowed uh, to, to drop these cases, or at the very least, there's supposed to be a fine and the possibility that royal authorities would take up the case. But as Groot discusses, this, this rarely seems to happen. And Groot argues, I think convincingly, that negotiated settlements are occurring here, even when they're not always talked about or so visible. Instead, uh, disputants are settling and cases are being dropped, particularly in these many examples of non-prosecution where a defendant is deemed without day, um, which means an indefinite adjournment, uh, which seems to usually have never been picked up. Um, so it's also quite telling that this is not a formal retraction or an expression of innocence, um, rather a more adjourning of the case. Um, authorities also likely knew that this was happening, um, and they seem to very rarely be taking up any of these dropped cases, uh, likely because um, the fines for non-prosecution were being paid anyway. And it also seems logical that this would be part of a negotiated settlement between parties, that if I'm suing you and then I drop the case, I know I'll get fined, but um, the other person would pay me um, a settlement fee, but then would also reimburse me for that fine. Uh, now, sometimes later, we also see this quite transparently um, when we see serious crimes um, that an accusation is made um, and then a license of Concord uh, is purchased from the justices um, and they're allowed to settle. Um, but this is not always the case. 
So uh, I just like to quickly look at two examples in which we see this happening a bit more clearly and we see actual kind of um, recognition of settlement. And so first is 1202 in Lincolnshire where we have Thomas accusing these two Roberts of uh, breaking his arm and robbing him. Um, and so the Roberts are seized, uh, but the accuser then drops this case, um, which he's penalized for, um, but payments are made and all parties come to peace and the jury here um, reports a concord. So it's quite interesting that here we're seeing a serious violent crime um, being negotiated out of with, with seemingly none of the punishments that we would expect for such a crime. In 1208 in Norfolk, uh, this in an example pointed to by Paul Hyams, uh, John appeals Herbert for killing John's brother in the Easter term, and then they prepare to have a duel at the next court. But uh, when we see them appear again in Trinity term, it's declared that they've come to an agreement and received a license from the king, which Herbert pays as well as money to John. But part of the agreement is that Herbert must go to Jerusalem for seven years and not return before. So we're even seeing added punitive conditions uh, being negotiated here, uh, which Himes notes that here's the threat of the duel itself and serious punishment of losing encourages Herbert to take a lesser punishment, which is maybe also recommended if he didn't think he's a very good fighter. So we're in this system where there seems to be high, incent high incentivization to come to settlement and out of fear of the punishment. Uh, something which I think is well summed up as being in the shadow of law, um, which I've sort of adopted from Paul Himes here. Um, so in conclusion, I think there are many caveats and other details that I wasn't able to get to. Um, and I would also like to get more to grips with further case evidence and later evidence. Um, but I think that I hope I presented that there's some reason to see this dynamic of love and law together um, as helpful for understanding English dispute settlement and as a reasonable suggestion of Scandinavian origin of some of these aspects. Now, one of the major underlying themes of my thesis has been this harshness of English law that increases over the period, maybe due in part to Scandinavian influence, um, but the way that this affects dispute uh, behavior may be a subtle and unintentional aftershock, uh, which I hope to explore more. I think it's worth making more comparisons, maybe to the continent, um, but I think in England there seems to be something unique about the expression of this love law binary with its Scandinavian roots. Maybe an example of the value of looking to the Dane law as a point of influence on English law, rather than simply looking to for English legal origins in Wessex or in Normandy. Um, and I think that here we're seeing dynamics that could underlie legal processes, which are much less obvious and harder to see. Lastly, uh, I think it's worth mentioning that the general point um, that this logic of informal legal procedure um, occurring in the shadow, or maybe we should say under the threat of more formal legal judgment and punishment is still at the center of the Anglo-American legal system and seems quite obvious to us today with 98% of criminal convictions in the US coming through plea bargains, 90% in England and Wales, um, you know, something that the Bar Association issued this report about critiquing. Uh, this is an ongoing aspect of our own legal culture with certain conceptions about it, um, being able to use the punitive law to pressure agreements in ways that have concerning results and are still up to debate continuing today. But I think for ongoing issues like these, it's important to contemplate origins. So I hope that I've encouraged you to do so in a slightly different way today. So thanks. Thank you so much, Jake. That was um, fascinating. We'll now take some questions for those here in person and online. Thank you. That was uh, very interesting. Um, I was just wondering what you thought about the making of 3 SL Reds. So who who provides the Scandinavian influence? Is it a council? Is it um, the king trying to pick up on something? If you had any clues to that? Yeah. Um, well, we're pretty confident that it happened at a royal assembly in Wantage, which is also a bit strange because that's the Wessex heartland and that's the birthplace of Alfred the Great. Um, but we have the record of an assembly happening there in that year, and then we have this coming out in that year. So we're pretty confident it happens at a royal assembly um, for which 
we know, particularly by the end of the 10th century, you have notables from all across the country. coming. We have these witness lists and we see people from the far north of England and we see quite a lot of Scandinavian names in there as well. Um, so I think that that's the context of it. Um, but something I argue for is just looking at um, the text itself. Um, it's clearly not sort of a West Saxon scribe coming up with these ideas and writing them down and forcing them upon the Dane law because why is he translating things into Old Norse? And why does he have things that don't make any sense? And Old Norse that we don't know what it means. Um, so I think there must be a very high level of Dane law influence on it. Of, I think probably elites and maybe thanes um, who were attending these assemblies, which we know that they did, and um, were influencing the creation of this code to some degree, which is I think why it's quite unique of, you can even see about half of it seems to be uh, things that the central English government wanted to do and are implementing in parallel ways. And then a lot of it is random things that seem to have nothing to do with what the English government wants. And I think that's where we're seeing um, local elites exerting their control in a way that is new. But short follow up, is, is there anything happening right at that time that, that brings that about? Because we have no other examples of these kind of local influences, well, local outside of Wessex at that time. Well, why it, suddenly they want to take that into their yeah. Um, well, there there is there is little bits, and well, and so um, like Ethelstan's code for London, for example, and then his code for Kent. You know, it seems to be his recognition of things are different in the localities and recognizing that. So I think one, it is a thing that could be happening. We just don't see very clearly all the time, um, and also. Uh, this is why there's there's so much speculation about what's going on in the politics of Ethelred's reign of, but obviously it was a very chaotic time. Um, there was already quite a lot of things going on in 997 and reasons for him to be nervous. So I think one possible context is this as a conciliatory sort of step towards um, people in the Dane law who he was probably quite concerned about, given that you also have Scandinavian invasions not that long. Hmm. Thank you very much. This is a quite a long way from anything I had to hear about. Um, I get the impression from the um, non-common law material, if you like, the, the, the pre-conquest material that you looked at, is that the codes provide for the possibility of somebody having a choice between law or love, and the sense of the law of love having something connected to permission. So I, I can I can get permission to settle. Whereas with this, with the abandonment of appeals, that strikes me as very much sort of um, at, at a level below the formal law, that the law isn't saying you've got a choice. Rather, it's saying you may not abandon the appeal, mm. but it's somehow allowing people to do that by not finding them, or they find a way of paying for the fine by getting the other side to include it in the compensation. And so are those, are those rather different? Yeah, well, for one, I, I think with early common law appeals, the fact that you then do have licenses to settle does indicate that there's there's an indication that um, this is something that the royal court is aware of and is sometimes wanting to give permission for specifically. And other times, maybe when they just have less control in, a, in an area, they're not. And we just see those those uh, records disappearing. So I, I do think even then there there is um, a royal interest in it of deciding who can um, settle or, or who can't. And it's also a, a natural part of what you would want as, as a royal government to, to be able to control something like that. Um, in the earlier period, um, we're not quite sure why occasionally you, you see this mention of, of that sort of enshrining um, negotiation when by the same way, you, you wouldn't think uh, legislation would want to do that. Um, and I think we're not quite sure why, but at the very least, the only places where we see it sort of enshrined in legislation is in this Dane law text, and then in an Anglo-Norman guy copying that Dane, that Dane law text. And we also know that he didn't know Old English very well. Um, we, I think we're pretty confident he didn't know Old Norse at all. Um, so I think possibly there's a level of these things are just getting copied without um, there being sort of a, a royal thought going into it. And of course, that's the problem dealing with the Legis Enrique in general. It's not a law code. It's a treatise of 
sort of things that this guy was thinking about and was finding different places and then splitting it together. But it's definitely a mystery. Sorry, so this question um, isn't doesn't have terribly much to do with any of the very interesting ideas you've kind of put forward. But I was just curious at the very beginning, you mentioned that um, in the last I think decade there had been an, a sort of an immense flowering of research about um, the kind of Scandinavian, the Viking incursions into these areas of northern England. What is the reason for that? Or like, are there any specific reasons? Yeah, um, well, I, I think there's in general, there's been uh, many discoveries that that have encouraged this. Um, a particular thing that people point to is the portable antiquities scheme uh, was started up in 1997. And then in the years after that, we've had um, amateur metal detectorists uh, finding all sorts of things. And, and so um, the one example I saw I showed was Jane Kershaw's work on Scandinavian jewelry. Um, and she talks about that um, over 90% of the corpus of what she's looking at has been found in the last 10 years. Oh, cool. And, and so that has completely kind of shifted the way that we're thinking about that. And part of her argument, which has been massively influential, is that just the scale of the things that we're looking at implies a large uh, amount of people, particularly when she's able to identify thousands of pieces that were specifically for women. And so why do you have Scandinavian um, right. pieces of jewelry that likely were made in Scandinavia are then appearing there? Um, it's quite telling in that way. So that's just one example, but um, there's been lots of discoveries and archaeology um, has been massive. In that. Okay, cool. Great. Thank you. Um, do we get any other alliterative phrases in the Anglo-Saxon laws? So th this is a point of it I've just been getting to and I, and I, I very interested in, in seeing more. Um, I don't know any off the top of my head. Uh, may, maybe others do. You get something like friend or foe, something like that mm -hmm. in Edmund's laws. But something I definitely like to explore more. And there is this historiography around this being a unique um, Old Norse feature, but that is something I, I should um, uh, be more critical of and see. Yeah. see in, in because it, it seems very likely that the alliterative phrase that you're referring to, um, the, the love or law, um, is from a Scandinavian oral culture, possibly Icelandic, um, where you get these repeated alliterative phrases. Um, and so what I'm interested in is whether that's something that you would find in Anglo-Saxon England too, a mm. type of alliterative phrase, uh, where there is an opposition between uh, or an oppositional comparison between the two elements. Mm. Well, what I have just thought of is sake and soak it oh, becomes cool. a big one. Yeah. But uh, that's one that also I think there's a decent case to make is is uh, Scandinavian. Um, and, we, and both of those terms uh, really only appear in the later 10th century after uh, Norse context. And so there's arguments both ways on, on those. Um, I think part of it might be that early Anglo-Saxon laws um, are often quite influenced by Latin, and this is something that Ingrid has worked quite a lot on. And so in from a Latin tradition, I don't think there is this interest in, in linear things. And the fact that they're translating into the vernacular, I think some of that might be lost versus in Scandinavian laws. Um, I think there's that oral aspect. Uh, it, it's more long lasting. Any further questions from anyone? Okay, I get that one. <laughs> Again, on the phrases the from Old Norse, maybe this is a bit unfair, but obviously the Norse sources are much later, and so could also be influenced by Latin, by canon law. Um, I'm not saying yeah. these particular phrases, but I do deal with that, the, the discrepancy in the time there between the late 10th century Anglo-Saxon stuff, 12th century Scandinavian stuff, 13th century Scandinavian stuff. Yeah, well, so definitely I have to be very careful doing anything with, with the Scandinavian stuff. Um, that is something we always have, have to worry about of, of the back and forth influence. Um, but I would also say in Iceland, I think that is less the case of the fact that um, these are being written down quite early and Iceland was so isolated um, that 
it, I think it's somewhat difficult to think of, of English law influencing Iceland in the 11th century or so, um, where we know, for, you know, we have original documents then from 13th century um, that were essentially untouched until Arne Magnuson uh, found them in the 18th century. Um, so I think in that there is some suggestion that that these were isolated systems, and which why I think Iceland's really interesting as an analogy because it's it's such an isolated place that in some ways seems to have encapsulated 10th century um, Scandinavian things. Um, but it's something I have to constantly worry about and, and try to double check and always caveat. With. There are no further questions. We might finish up there. Um, please do join us at the Granta and please join me once again in thanking Jake.